Hello and a very good evening. Welcome to the Claw Studio here at the Royal Albert Hall for this insight, which is sponsored <laughs> by... Did I say the Royal Albert Hall? The Royal <laughs> Opera House, which is sponsored by Rolex. I'm Ian Skelly and I'm here to explore tonight a production here at Covent Garden of uh, Cavalleria, Rusticana and Pagliacci. Cav and Pag, as they're so often known. Two different operas by two different composers, written just within the space of a couple of years of each other. Cav was written by Pietro Mascagni in 1890, and then uh, Pag was written by G uh, Ruggiero Leoncavallo in 1892. Uh, Cav has just one act to it, and Pag has two short acts and a short prelude, which means that they're both short and therefore also dealing with the same kinds of themes. So they tend to be put together as a double bill. Together they exemplify the Verismo movement in Italian opera. Verismo means realism, and it stemmed out of a similar movement in Italian literature. And essentially the point was to try and depict real, harsh, difficult life often lived by people, particularly in the southern regions of Italy. So what we have here at the Royal Opera House is Damiano Michelotti's fascinating 2015 Olivier Award-winning production, which puts the two operas together. And he cleverly takes these two opera classics to produce a cleverly observed uh, recreation of life in a typical southern Italian village, where emotions ride high and eventually explode as a theatrical company rides into town and all sorts of awful things happen, uh, mainly driven by a secret love affair and by also unbridled, uncontrollable jealousy. The drama is intense and passionate and the score is full of instantly recognisable memories, which makes Cav and Pag a wonderful evening out at the opera. It's a chance to really enjoy uh, Italian opera in the uh, most familiar of its forms. Well, tonight I shall be talking to the director of this revival. Antonio Papano is also going to be here to take us through some of the music of both scores. He conducts a star cast in this production, led by Jonas Kaufmann. And we have two members of the cast here this evening to begin with, to talk through their roles and this production. Uh, Emanuela Yaho, who sings Neda, and Alexander Korsak, who sings Santuzza. So would you, would you please welcome them both? Welcome to both of you. I know you've had a long day of rehearsals. You're looking splendid, despite the fact you've been in a rehearsal room uh, for so long. Uh, Emanella, you, you have... Uh, uh, this is the first time you've sung this role, which rather surprises me. What, what took you so long? Yes, it took so long because maybe, I don't know, always I thought uh, maybe I needed more time to build uh, a character like, you know, Manon Lescaut or Madama Butterfly. And I loved the drama, and, and in that, that I didn't see with that with uh, with that eye, you know. And uh, yeah, it, this is, it is the first time, and it's so challenging, not only vocally because if I think you know singing operas, you know, and you have to be three hours on stage, it's not so difficult. But uh, it's you know you have to change in so little time, four five. Five um, state of her 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 uh, emotion, you know, and it's so uh, it's a multi-dimensional, I could say, and it's it's challenging because she starts, you know, happy, because it's the only the only with the, her aria, it's the only moment when she she remembers when she was happy when she was a child, a little girl, and after that she has this duet, a little. A little strong, if I can say, with Tonio and uh, a beautiful love duet. Finally, a soprano has a beautiful duet with a baritone, yes. with Silvio. <laughs> it's fantastic. And at the end, you know, the, uh, the death and, uh, yeah, so it's going to be challenging. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, Alexandra, you've previously sung that role in uh, this production when it appeared in Barcelona. Now you jump tracks and you're singing Santuzza, so you're in the, the other show. Um, how is it working on, on the other side of the opera, do you find? It's absolutely amazing. I, I've been in love with this role of Santuzza since many, many years. I saw it for the first time in the famous movie with uh, Obrastova and Domingo. 
So, and it was sung by a big, big mezzo voice. So I've never thought in my life that I will one day sing Santuzza. <clears throat> so it has happened actually when I discovered the singer who created the role. It was the Emma, uh, Emma Belliccioni, who was the soprano, and she, was, she created the role with Mascani himself. And I just now uh, found her uh, biography on the internet, very, very interesting. Then she said uh, herself that her signature role was La Traviata and Lucia di Lammermoor. So I said, come on, how does it go <laughs> with Santuzza? She was the first Santuzza chosen by Mascani himself. And um, so I sang this for the first time with my husband as well, Roberto, and the first Turido was Roberto Stagno, Sicilian guy, like my husband. Yes. <laughs> so we were the, 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 the couple on the stage um, in the real life. And it was, it's very, very beautiful. But this point um, that I, when I discovered that she was the Violetta and Lucia changed a little bit my way of thinking about the character. Because I said it, it can, it, you can, I try to show it in a bit different way, like a, of course, naive person, very vu uh, vulnera vulnerable, yes? Yes, yes. Um, and, and full of love, uh, very young, and it, it changed a lot. She's with the hope and to create something important in her life. And the music, it's absolutely one of the most beautiful ever written. Mm. It's absolutely gorgeous. And, and the, the, from the musical point of view, um, technical, it's actually written very strange in very strange way. For example, uh, originally the, the big duet between soprano and tenor was written even higher, uh, a half tones, with, it's already very demanding and very <laughs> difficult. So even the one higher, it was probably almost not possible to, to sing it because of the tessitura, it's very high. And when you see it's really bel canto tessitura, like you have in Lucia, it, everything on the passaggio, very demanding from both. Um, the aria as well, the duetto with Alfio as well. So. Um, I don't know, actually, very, maybe you know it, when the tradition <coughs> came from that it was sung by the mezzo, in the scores it's written as well soprano. Interesting. So, yeah. um, and uh, Emanella, you, you, this, this gave me a car courage yes. to do this. Uh, Emanella, you're, you're uh, regarded as uh, one of the great Verismo interpreters. I wonder what it is about this, this style of opera that makes it so special. And, and do you, as a singer, have to think in a very different way when it comes to playing characters? Like this. Verismo, uh, as you said that before, it's um, the the verismo in, in Italian, the the real the real stories from the south of uh, Italy. I was I'm lucky if I could say that because I come from Albania and uh, that part of the world, you know, the Balkan style, which everything I love you, I hate you, it's louder. So in somehow it helps me. <laughs> and. Uh, the way how to think about that is so the, really declamative, you know, and the composers, they wrote that as uh, like they've been the, the stage directors. When you have to say something really with a strong emotion, almost, if I can say that loud or screaming to make that more believable, because w when we have a, a loss in our family, so we have something with the real emotion, we don't think, let me now put in a position to say beautifully, no. You react, you know, really in a, in a violent way, if I could say that. So, and uh, you have to have courage to, to let it go, and if you have, even to, to declamate louder, even if it's not a real bel canto, they are colors, they are colors that uh, give, they give the emotion to the, to the character, especially in Verismo. And uh, I, uh, I love Verismo. I started singing, you know, for a long time, so far, uh, Madame Butterfly or Sor Angelica. And uh, there are certain moments that uh, I think all the human beings, we have that. And sometimes in Verismo, you cannot control. If I can say that simply, you cannot control that. And, uh, that's why it's so, and it's straightforward. You don't prepare that so much. Like, for example, in Bel Canto, you have the recitative, mm -hmm. the aria, the cabaletta, so you can show all your abilities, you know, with the coloraturas. And uh, in Verismo, it's the drama, straightforward. And very fast. You have it's to so fast. That's why the challenging in this case for me, for Neda. And, uh, and to make that believable, really, you have 
to believe in what you're singing. And if you have to cry, if it's something, a sad story, you have to cry yourself, you know. You have to put yourself in 100% in the character, into the character, because only in that way you can connect with the public. Because the public, when we are on stage, we are completely naked. Mm. So even if when we rehearse, sometimes we just, uh, you know, protect ourselves, okay, we don't have, uh, we, okay, I'm not singing forte here and there. But when you are on stage, you have to give everything. Because if you, you have to cry yourself to make public crying, mm. you have to believe in it. So no compromises, if I could say. You have yeah. to have the courage to go forward. Otherwise, it's not going to be that connection with public. And for the public, it's going to be only, OK, she's yeah. singing well. But uh, yeah. And these, although they're very short operas, they are very, very intense dramas where the audience, I think, at times, isn't quite sure whether to sympathize with either of you or, or not. I mean, Santuza always strikes me to be uh, caught in a spider's web, really. She, she is a victim, I think, isn't she, would you say? You know, I do, I do not see it like that. I see the victim of Cavalleria, it's Turiddu. You always see Turiddu a bad guy because he changed the, the woman and now he's so the bad guy. It's not that white and black everything in the life. Turidu was betrayed by Santuzza, by Lola and by Alfio, by everybody. Santuzza knew very well that Turidu was in love with Lola. When they knew, knew each other from the very beginning when they were a child. Before he went to the army, he asked her to marry him. He said yes. He comes from the army and Lola is married with another one, with a stranger, because in Sicily at that time, another village is, was already the str a stranger. <laughs> so, so even worse, it's not from the same village. So he, what he does, what probably we know everybody from our life, to, to forget a big love. Sometimes you think the best medicine is the new one. So he, Okay, he's very popular, very handsome, all the girls in the village crazy about him. So he takes this Santuzza. Maybe he loves her, he loves, no maybe, he do, he does, he loves her. Well, he, because, asks, he asks his mother to... Yes, on the end he said, yeah. mom became a mother for her, yeah. for Santa. <laughs> he had some feeling, but this, the, the very first big love for Lola, he just can't forget it. And Lola is the mean person in this, in this show, because as soon she, she said that, Maybe he will be happy with Santuzza. What? I'm not the, better, the best one in the village. So no, I make you to, to come back to me. So he's like really between both of them. I think they both are victims of the youthness of themselves. Mm. Unexperienced life, big hopes for the future. But I do not see really Turidu as a very bad guy and, and Santuzza, the poor one. She knew that he was in love with another one, but she was in love with him as well. So when so, she... When she uh reveals the affair, Yes. as soon as she does that, because it's quite a key moment in, in the opera, uh, uh, is she happy about doing that, do you think, or does she instantly regret no, it? No, I think in the moment it's like, you know, the person, the woman, I think, as well, when we just desperate, jealous, uh, felt abandoned, and she doesn't think. We women... We react with our emotions first, very often. Instead to think, we do the no, things, then we regret. Oh, of course we do. <laughs> so I think it's the way like this. It's her character. She's a very proud woman, a very si proud Sicilian woman. Yep. And in the first moment, it's like, I will tell you he is a wrong. He said, you know, I don't want to say bad words now about him, so I will tell. Speak then, Sicilian. Then she regrets. <laughs> yes, yes, I can speak Sicilian. <laughs> uh, then she regrets, of course, afterwards, because, you know, it's not nice to be betray the, the, the person you love, and mm. she knows very well the, that how it will, what the consequence will be, that mm. there's no choice, they, they will fight. Yes. So, Emanella, what about Neda? Um, are we supposed to sympathise with her? She's in a similar sort of driving position, yes. isn't she? I understand. For me, Neda, she's a victim of certain circumstances because she was abandoned from her mother and she was found from Kanyo. Kanyo is older than her. He gave her, you know, a house or a place to live and, uh, and she's grateful, but she's young. Mm -hmm. And in somehow, you know, um, he, he feels entitled because he's older, of course she's beautiful, 
and in somehow he feels entitled, you know, not to treat her very well and not to think about her youth. So, and she's stuck, she's stuck. And, uh, and the moment, and she was, uh, and he doesn't treat her very well, even in front of every other, other uh, of the others, because we see the, the, the way how Tonio, another, uh, another part of this circle, if I can say, okay, and he doesn't, uh, he doesn't treat very well uh, uh, Neda. So in their duet, and somehow they feel entitled to treat her badly. So she knows that. And she's suffering because it's something that she's missing her freedom, her liberty. And she's in, she, she has her right to, 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 to live her life, you know, like uh, everyone else. And when she meets um, Silvio, that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, falling in love, you know, with the first sight, and finally she understands, she feels something different. And uh, almost she's afraid to, 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 to love someone, you know? And uh, so that's, uh, and I think it's a simple, I, I, the public should feel the sympathy with her because how many times in our lives we feel stuck of certain situations and you wanna, you wanna free yourself, but sometimes it's impossible or, there are certain circumstances that you cannot do that. And, uh, but still, she has that proud, you know, and at the end, when Kanyo, because Kanyo, when he uh, finds out that she has a lover, okay, and at the end, you know, he, the way how he talks to her, really, really so bad, bad words, that she, he treats her so badly, and in somehow, it's a trigger, and finally, your soul reacts. And uh, that's why she's telling, stronger than your hate, maybe I'm not, I wasn't worth it for my mom because she abandoned me, but stronger than your hate, it's my love. And that's why, you know, she goes and uh, she dies. So I think she's strong, it's a tortured soul. She's a tortured soul and, uh, and uh, yeah, and I, li I love her character. It's gonna be challenging, as I repeat myself, because there are all these changes in a little time. So, and everyone, we have that inside. So in somehow, it's gonna be, yeah, it's gonna be a little <laughs> difficult for me to give those emotions, so yeah. I want to talk just a little bit in a while about um, the, the play within the play, which is always a complicated thing, I think, to pull off. But what's interesting about this production is that both of you, who are in different operas, appear in the other opera as well. The, the intermezzos are cleverly used here, aren't they, to, to carry the, the, the two characterizations, or the two stories, into each other. I mean, uh, Santuza is, is seen in the intermezzo in, in uh, Cav, um, Reconciling, really, isn't she? Yes. In uh, Pag, rather. Sorry, she's in Pag. Uh, yes, <laughs> confusing. Yes. Santusa <laughs> in Pag is seen in the intermezzo That's of Pagliacci. Right. <laughs> so it makes a life a bit harder because you finish the show and go, with the wonderful weather, you can have a glass of wine. Instead of this, you have to wait for your appearance after the break. But, it, just kidding, but it's, of course, very beautifully done. Because after, of course, it, it's finished like it's finished. The Turido is dead, the Mama Lucia suffering. So she caused all these problems in the village. What, what she can do now? You know, she was not respected because she went before a marriage with a, with a man in dead times, the end of the world, of course. So already not respected by nobody, not, not now even by the mother because he caused the death of her son. And this is beautifully done in, um, in Pagliacci that she comes, she just really suffering and she's talking with the priest on the stage, telling him everything, how she feels, she felt guilt guilty. And then here it comes the mom, the mom Lucia, and she doesn't know why she comes. The priest didn't say her that he arranged, arranged the, the meeting of the two women. And she's like, I don't want to talk with you. And Santuzza wants to tell her. And this was the idea here to say that I'm pregnant and with your, with your, with your son. And it's, this is when they, they make really the peace and there is the future for both women. Mm. They have the, the, the meaning in their life and the, the, to live yeah. simply. They have this, maybe this, another to redo, a small one. 
So this is very touching, very moving. We just did this scene today in, uh, in, in the rehearsal and we were both crying with, uh, with wonderful Mamma Lucia, oh, with wonderful yeah. singer and actress. Gosh. Very beautiful moment. Well, let's just talk briefly uh, to, to end this part of the conversation about this, and you've both done it, this complicated scene in, in Pagliacci where you're, you're playing two people <laughs> at the same time. Um, I mean, are you in your head playing two people? Do you have to, I mean, you're doing it on this particular production. Um, do you have to keep jumping between the two? Is it, is it quite easy it's, to do? It's not easy. Yeah. It's not easy. It's not easy. It's written beautifully because vocally it brings you, you know, to be someone, you know, Columbina. So you're playing there, you're the actor. And, uh, and the behind scene, you know, is the, the, real, the real drama. So it's not easy, it's not easy, but uh, that's our duty as artists, you know, to make what is, to make it looking, you know, easy for the public, but uh, not for us, so, yeah. But I, I would say it's, uh, the public will be, um, you know, you'll be really surprised because there is, especially in this production, it's a part of Italy. It, it's done beautifully from uh, uh, Micheletto, Damiano Micheletto, because he brought, you know, with his genius idea, the, the, a little Italy in uh, Cavalleria and in Pagliacci, and you see the life there. And it feels some, you know, after 10 minutes, I've seen that from the other part as a public. And after 10 minutes, I felt like I was living that, that situation because it's so real, all the details. And uh, it's like um, watching a movie, like, you know, that we get used to see, like, I'm not saying Godfather, but <laughs> that kind of movie, you know, it's done really, really beautifully. And I would like to thank even the other colleagues, they are not here. We all are trying to do our best, mm. you know, the stage director and Master Tony Papano to work on all the details to make it so believable and to have this kind of connection and uh, to resonate because there are human feelings, you know, emphasized hate, love, death, revenge, you know, that uh, human, uh, human feelings that What's not everyone... to like, as they say. Yeah, exactly. Well, I know you've had a very long day, both of you, in rehearsals, quite emotional from what you were saying as well. So thank you very much indeed for sparing the time this evening to uh, talk you. to us. Alexandra and Amola, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget this production launches on the 5th of July. Well, let's turn now to the person responsible for making sure that this uh, production works on stage. The original production in 2015 was devised, as you've heard, by Damio, Damiano Michioletto, and uh, the job of recreating that production for this run is down to Noah Namat. Would you please welcome her? Thank you very much for joining us after what I imagine has been quite a, a busy time for you. You're no stranger to this, or indeed no newcomer to the Royal Opera House, are you? No, not quite, yeah. I was a stage director, young artist here, so it very much feels like home and it's always great to be back. Yes. You weren't involved in the original production, but I think you were involved in the 2017 revival. Um, is it different this time around for you? I mean, with the revivals, it's always different, isn't it? Because you have different singers and, you know, my job is, obviously, I'm committed to the vision, the concept, the mise-en-scene, what we say, which is the physical action, the blocking. Um, but I think it's also really important to, you know, give space to the artistry of the singers while having the vision of the production in mind. Mm. Yeah. So have things changed, though, for you since 2017? I mean, some things always change. Um, I've worked in the past with, with Damiano, and it's always coming down to the finding truthfulness on stage. So, you know, if a certain gesture happens a bit different or happens slightly in a different moment in the music, it doesn't really matter because obviously different singers are, have different bodies and different energies. So um, it's important to give them space to create 
yeah. their own thing while also obviously maintaining the, the bigger picture of the production. So yeah. what's, the, what's the role of the revival director? Do you have to watch the original production? I, presumably there's a video or something and watch it meticulously. What, how do you go about it? Um, because I worked on the production in 2017, um, so, so I knew the production inside out. Um, so yeah, so, so the job is basically, you know, um, because it's, it's not just to, just to do a copy paste of what was done. You have to find the right intentions for the right people and you have to give them the backstory and you have to see, you know, because different sopranos are, you know, have different bodies, etc. So it's, it's really important that we, that I allow them um, to bring also their character into this place, but also obviously making sure that we are sticking with what the original vision was. Yeah, but I mean, when you were originally, in, if you are directing a, an original production, there's an, an awful lot of conversation in the rehearsal room about motivation, about characterization, moves, all sorts of things. Um, but what you're saying is you're not, you're not simply a dictator when it comes to a revival. That same, <laughs> <not>. that same <laughs> dialogue still happens, does it, in the rehearsal room? Yes. So yes. do things change and are, are diff different because of that? I mean, has this, ha have you put your um, mark on this production, if I might ask that? Yeah, I mean, obviously there are certain moments that, you know, might feel different when you have different energy in the room. And so it's not just forcing the singers to do whatever we did last time. It's, it's also, you know, be sensitive about it. And, you know, when something feels right, it just feels right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and what about the, the, the fact that they're so often performed together? Um, I mean, I think everybody gets slightly confused uh, with all of the different characters and which of the two they're in, particularly when you have the, the, the play at the, at the end of, of Pagliacci. Um, is it very important for you as a director to keep very clearly in your mind the two operas distinct? What, what their motivations are, what the composer was trying to achieve? Well, part of this concept of, 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 and I'm kind of calling it this production, because as much as we have two separate operas that are usually performed as a double bill, um, the intention here in this beautiful production was to create one coherent story. Mm. And so basically we're following the people of these ordinary people in this tiny village, poor village in the south of Italy. Um, and so if you want to think about it almost as a community that represents, that represents you know, a human, uh, something much more universal, humanity. And so we see them cry together, we see them laugh together, we see them pray together. Um, it's a bit like the circle of life because we start with Easter in Cavalleria, Pasqua, um, which represents the resurrection of Jesus. And then, without giving too many spoilers, you know, we finish with, with the death of the lovers at the end. So, you, in a way, we kind of complete a full circle. So, but, but the key element of the concept was that this is one story of one community, and this is why we have characters from the other operas coming in. So, for example, Silvio, which is a character in Pagliacci, we already see him in Cavalleria. He's this little boy, you know, a teenager who works at the bakery of Mamma Lucia. Um, and just so it happens that Nedda and Beppe, that are also characters in Pagliacci, come into town uh, to promote their show that is coming into town. So they hang the poster and they hand out the <laughs> flyers. Um, and this is the real moment of, you know, Colpo di Fulmine, where we see Nedda and Silvio actually having that spark and falling in love, which is a beautiful way to show their backstory in Cavalleria, and then when we actually see them together in Pagliacci, we understand how they met, what happened there, uh, etc. Yeah. And of course, as Alexandra was saying, that beautiful moment of Santuzza, because usually the opera ends and there is no resolution to her story. Yeah, yeah. But actually bringing back using the intermezzo of Pagliacci is a wonderful way to have some sort of resolution. It's a moment of speranza, of luce, of some sort of, of, of delight yeah. that she gets to share with Mamma Lucia. So the set is very important as well, and it's a fabulous mm. set, this, isn't yeah. it? It sort of rotates, and just talk us through what the, how the set works. It yeah, works so, so as part of the concept, yes, the idea was to set it in this one village, but we do have two different sets. So in Cavalleria, um, we have the bakery of Mamma Lucia uh, on one side, and then we also have an open space as a piazza on the other side, so we don't have a church or something like that. And then when we get to Pagliacci, um, it's set in a church hall uh, where we have a gym, we have a, an auditorium where the, you know, the people in town come to have a choir rehearsal. Um, we have a dressing room. 
But what's common into both of those sets is that it's all on the Revolve stage, which I think really gives us the opportunity to, it has a bit of a filmic feeling to it. Mm. And it also means that you can see somebody going from a public space to an intimate space. So it, it kind of highlights the verismo quality of it because you get to follow a character from what happens when it's outside to what happens a moment after when they walk into the dressing room. Um, so it's, it's a really beautiful mechanism that is constantly in operation as mm. part of the, the production. I'm fascinated by the loaves as well. I'm not sure if they are real bread, but it certainly looks like real dough, mm, I must say. I will keep that to your <laughs> imagination. <laughs> and what about the chorus? Because uh, th that is, as you've already pointed out, a kind of in intimate aspect of this particular uh, production. What, what role does the chorus play, would you say? Yeah, so as part of that concept, it, it kind of came to life because of the similarities between the operas. So, you know, they both have roughly the same length and they both have structurally the intermezzo. Um, they all have some sort of a love triangle, um, but more than, and you know, the, there's the death at the end, but you know, kind of more than anything, they have the chorus as a very present, you know, tool that is driven all throughout. Um, and, and what's really nice, so the chorus, even in terms of their costumes, they have the same costumes in both operas, so mm -hmm. they're the same people. Um, and they play a really massive role, and I think especially for someone like Santuzza, because um, as part of her story, when she's outside, the way the people look at her, looking down at her, knowing what she did and knowing what, you know, how she had that relationship with Turiddu, even though he was engaged to Lola, so they're very judgmental. So the chorus has a very important role, except that the scenes that they're in, of course, but, but they also give us a bit of an insight into what was the atmosphere like hmm. in that village. And just finally, uh, the, the, the process of producing a play within a play, the action within the play, um, you have to reveal that that is what is happening, that there are two people rowing on the stage and it's not part of the play. Um, how, do you, how do you achieve that sense of reveal amongst the audience? Because people have to suddenly realise, don't they, that this is not what was written in the script, as it were. Mm, yeah. Is that difficult to do for you? Um, well, it's quite interesting with this one because usually there are two layers in Pagliacci. So you have the first layer, which is the theatre actors and stage managers. You know, we have Nedda, we have Beppe, we have Silvia, we have uh, Canio, Tonio, that they make kind of part of the theatre group. So we, this is one story, and they have their own tricky relationship, Ned that cheating on, on Kanyo with, with Silvio, etc. Um, but on top of that, there's the second layer, which is the show, where Ned Da is playing Colombina, mm. who in the show is cheating on <laughs> Pagliaccio, which is played by Kanyo, and um, she cheats on him with Arlecchino. So, you know, so, so that second layer. But in our production, just to add more complexity and, and depth to it, we have a third layer which is we get to see in certain moments what happens in Kanyo's head. So for example, when the comedia starts, or when the real show starts, it's very clear that it's a show, there is a mini stage, we have all the chorus sitting as audience, so, so we're setting it very clearly. But then slowly, slowly, the whole revolve, you know, starts to move and we get an insight into Kanyo's head. And it's becoming a bit of this grotesque nightmare of him seeing Nedda cheating on him with everybody. Um, so that's an extra added layer. So, mm. so it, we, we're kind of building it slowly, but, but I'm, I'm sure you'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to come along and see it. No, yeah. thank you very much indeed for sparing the time to thank come and give us an insight much. into this. You've given us a great appetite to come and see this production now. Ladies and gentlemen, thank our director much. tonight, no Nedda. Well, next up tonight, it's time for some music. And who better to guide us through the score than the man who is going to be in the pit for this production, Sir Antonio Papano, who is conducting uh, this opera. I'm delighted to say that he's joined this evening by a fabulous young artist, Sac John Beck, and also at the piano, Michael uh, Papadopoulos. Would you please welcome all three of them? Good evening, everyone. Um, I plan these operas every now and again because um, I find them, and in particular Cavalleria Rusticana, the most 
challenging um, operas to conduct. Um, they are both perfect pieces of theatre, but I tell you, um, just from a sheer technical level and, um, and uh, to get all the shapes of the phrases right, to get it so that it sounds absolutely real, um, I find, yeah, it's really, really scary. And so I do it to myself every now and again, every five years. I, I plan these operas so I, I see if I can get it, you know, to another level. Um, Verismo is a very interesting thing because, as just to remind you again, it's a, it was a movement to get away from the subject matter, the political subject matter, the higher ups, and to bring subject matter down to the people and the poor people mainly. Um, these pieces, though, were written a few years before La Boheme. Um, a Cavalleria Rusticana was premiered in 1890. Um, Leon Cavallo, seeing the success of Mascagni's opera two years later, decided to, to try his hand at a one actor. And in 1892, um, his opera was premiered in Milan with no other than Arturo Toscanini conducting uh, the first night. And of course, by 1893, it was clear to everyone that these pieces belonged together. But the Verismo idea of, of somehow making the subject matter more earthy and that the blood and the dagger was somehow uh, thrust to the top, that, that kind of tawdry almost subject matter. And the betrayal that's, I mean, it's, uh, they're almost like soap operas, but violent soap operas. In Leon Cavallo's Pagliacci, as most of you will know, there's a prologue, and it's a very, very famous piece of music. But I just want to share with you um, the, the, the text, because it, it basically tells you everything you need to know about Verismo. And uh, as you know, he, uh, uh, Tonio, one of the players, one of the clowns, comes forth um, in front of the curtain, and he says, may I, may I? He says, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, excuse me, but I am the prologue, okay? And I'm alone, and I'm sorry if I'm alone, but I just, I want to tell you a few things. And um, he says, we're using some of the old school. It, he's talking about the Commedia dell'arte, and so Columbine and, and Harlequin and these things. But, um, so we're using some of those elements, and therefore I've been sent to you. He says, but this time, it's, there's no um, sort of uh, warning that says the tears that we shed are fake and the spasms and our torture, the torture that we suffer um, shouldn't alarm you. He says, no, no, there's no warning on this packet, you know. He says, the author has instead wanted to paint you a slice of real life. And his maxim, his plan, is to show you that an artist is also a, is a man, is a human being. And he's writing uh, for human beings and he's been inspired by the truth, okay? And now he paints a picture of, of the author writing, and he's sitting there in sort of a dream world, in he calls it a nest of memories. Um, and, and he hears all these memories singing to him in a way. And he was actually beginning to cry himself, and his uh, sobs became the beat of the music that he was writing, okay? Um, he says, okay, so you've, understand, you've understood that picture. And he says, now, you will see um, uh, people in love. You'll see how humans love each other. You will see hate. 
you, you will see the sad fruits of hate, the, the spasms of pain, the screams of rage you will hear, and cynical laughter, and you hear the orchestra boom, 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 <laughs> doing this. Um, and e voi piuttosto che le nostre povere gabbani di strioni, le nostre anime considerate. So instead of our costumes, our poor costumes, look in, inside our souls. Because we are men and we are flesh and bones just like you. E quel che di questo orfano mondo al pari we are the same as you we want to breathe the same air as you so and then he he breaks out of of this very very serious uh, philosophical discussion about theater or the type of theater that they're going to present and he says um i've told you the concept now listen uh, how it's going to take how it's all going to uh, pan out andiamo incominciamo let's begin um I'll uh, just uh, show you uh, how this opera begins. And one of the things that's, that's very, very important, well, you'll notice immediately, though Pagli Pagliacci comes second in the evening, um, I have actually done it once where Pagliacci came first and we reversed it. But um, that's not important for you to know. But, uh, but, but, but the, this, the order we're doing it is the usual order. And you'll hear in Pagliacci, the thing to notice is the, the sophistication of the orchestration. It's much more uh, polished, if you like, though it's about murder, blood and guts, betrayal, adultery, all, this, all, all these things, uh, as is the other piece. This one uh, has a, 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 a thrusting um, dynamism, but a polished uh, dynamism. If you listen to the beginning, the gestures of the music are quite clear. Listen. <laughs> so you hear dum da dum dum, and then it's like somebody whistling, bidi 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 bum, bidi 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 bum in the flutes uh, uh, and the oboe, and dum da dum dum da dum da 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 dum da dum da dum da dum da. It's almost inviting you to the show. Again, in complete contrast with the other piece, you will hear, of course. This time played by the horns. One of the saddest melodies. And then we hear this romantic music here. <laughs> this is the young lovers. But there's trouble. And there's no, there's um, and threat. Sorry, this most important phrase. Go, go ahead. That's the danger of the betrayed husband. That's the potential for violence. In those, da, 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 that th slight thrusting uh, melody that goes up is poisons the atmosphere of the whole piece. Okay. Um, that's be particularly beautiful phrase when he says, he talks about the author composing the piece and sitting at his table and in, in tears and listen to how this is in the... It's really... With, and we've, if we get the right sound in the orchestra and the, our singer can sing it so beautifully, softly, can really draw you in. It's just absolutely fantastic. Um, of course, Melody, 
um, it's, it's an Italian composer, Leon Cavallo, and of course melody is paramount. Um, and of course you have the big tune um, where he says, don't look at our costumes, think, look into our souls. Going ever higher in the phrase. Etc., etc., etc. So it's a music that has a seductive quality um, uh, 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 as well as, as telling a you know, real life story. Um, I'm going to now move to Cavalleria and just keep in mind what you just heard on the beginning. The hustle and bustle of Pagliacci. Now, uh, listen to how this one starts. Uh, to me, this music, which is, has about, I would say, 75% fewer notes than Pagliacci does. Pagliacci is very virtuosic. Cavalleria is not virtuosic at all. It's, it's sort of made from the clay of the earth. It's like, it's like, the, um, um, it's like a mud. It feels like mud when you're conducting it. it it's, it's, it's extremely resistant. It's primitive in a way, and yet it creates a magic. This opening music creates a feeling of the heat of the place, Sicily, creates a deep feeling of Christianity uh, creates a passion um, and an earthiness by the use of certain bass notes, which I'll point out to you. Um, and of course, melody here um, is... The melodies here are less sexy than they are in Pagliacci, but they're somehow more profound because of that. And I, I, I will show you what I mean. So we get these little shards of light at the beginning from the strings. And then the harp gives it a little color. And then harmony changes to the minor key. Again, the, um, the melody is like rising like it was in Pagliacci. There's an ambition in the melody somehow. And then the Italian ornaments here. It starts to develop through volume and speed. Finally becoming quite impatient. Before I go on, I want to I want you to hear something. If you play from here and make sure that the C, the bass note, carries through. When I said earthiness, the how he achieves that is through what we call uh, pedal notes. In other words, a note that, that the bass stays the same over changing harmonies on top. And if you listen here, there's a no So this is where the music starts to move. That note is still there, and it is still there through all these changes. Bam, 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 bam. And finally it is released. Yeah. The, um, I think that's, in a very, very simple way, he's, he's uh, achieved something that is um, almost intangible, but, it's, but you can hear it somehow it conjures up uh, deeper, deeper things in us, right? Most of the prelude of, of, in, uh, of Cavalleria is dedicated to music of the love duet um, between, well, it's not, a, it's a fight duet, actually, between Turiddu, um, the young man, and Santuzza. 
the girl with whom he's taken up with um, after finding out that his real love, Lola, has gotten married while he was away um, in the army. And uh, her melodies are very, very special indeed. If you hear, and you hear the, the folk element, you hear the harp quite a lot, and the harp is there as if it were an ancient instrument. So I mean, think of Sicily as an, as an ancient society. Here. Uh, it's exquisite and very, very simple. Woodwinds with the harp, it's really uh, quite something. Then the strings come in, bah, bah, but you have to. Uh, you have to buy a ticket to hear that one, yeah. <laughs> okay. Very unusual, um, very unusual in, the, uh, in this prelude is that it is interrupted by the sound of a voice off stage singing a serenade. It's the voice of, of the tenor, Turidu. And uh, what's interesting about it is that it's written in Sicilian dialect. And it gives you also a taste of, of the violent world they live in because he's singing to Lola and he says, you know, you have this beautiful white um, blouse that you wear um, and, and it's, it's white and red. red he was talk, he's talking now about her lips and red like a cherry. And um, you, when you appear at the window, uh, you smile and uh, happy is the man who can give you the first kiss. Uh, I know that in your house blood has been shed, so that there's, a ha there's a, an ill-fated star over her house. And boy, are those words true. Um, but I don't care if I am murdered, assassinated. Um, uh, I, and if I go into paradise, uh, if I don't find you there, I'm not going to enter, he says. Um, so already in a few phrases, we're talking about murder and dying, and it's a love song. You know, that's the flavor. And again, the harp accompanies him as if it were a guitar. And um, I mean, I'll, I have no voice today, and I'm not going to sing it, believe me. Um, but um, uh, our tenor tonight, who has been working all day, and I can only make him sing one thing. So, um, but the idea is this, you hear this lilting rhythm Lola kai di la ti la cammi sa e si bianca russa come una cira so so it has a very very uh, provincial and as if you were hearing a Neapolitan song but in a, in a or Solimio or something like that but in a, a different dialect and in the Sicilian dialect there's lots of oos um, very close to Latin and the, 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 the Romance languages, you know, uh, Romanian, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So we hear lots of themes in this prelude, um, and the interesting thing about it, um, the, the themes are mainly uh, encapsulated then later in, into this duet that I spoke about, which is the center of this piece. But what, what I find very interesting is in the first 15 minutes of this opera, nothing happens. Nothing um, uh, of storyline. The, the production has cleverly, uh, as Noah said before, combined the uh, different elements from both pieces so we get to know certain characters. But it's all in silence while the chorus sings about their day and the perfume of the oranges and the in the in the groves and the, and the heat you feel the heat and the, the, there's a sensuality to the ladies' music and there's a masculinity to the to the to the male choristers' music, but one of the most important themes that you will hear and defines the role of Santuzza very clearly is this this theme and um, she is downtrodden because she's or she, although she's she's in love with Turidu she knows that he's now betraying her 
with Lola. He's fallen back in love uh, with Lola, um, who, as I said, got married while he was away. And this is her state of, uh, of mind and soul. The celli, all the strings. Now this phrase will be developed as it climbs up again. Down to the lowest string of the cello. She has hope. But she's desperate also. But hope comes back again. So we, here we heard this. And then, oh, it's, it's not gonna be good. Uh, and the music shivers, yeah? It's a fantastic portrait of a desperate woman. It's just absolutely wonderful. I'm gonna jump now, uh, before I, we have our musical excerpt, I'm gonna go to the fa famous piece in Pagliacci, the tenor aria, the end of the first section, and just go through it with you a little bit so you can understand what motivates it and what, it, what it's about, because it's also a definition of, the, of what Verismo is. And uh, as you've probably seen before, and as you probably know, Canio is uh, being uh, betrayed by his wife, uh, Nedda, uh, with a young man called Silvio, and he catches them basically in the act. He doesn't manage to catch Silvio. Um, Silvio runs, but of course, he's left alone and with the thought, and he's desperate, and the music gets extremely violent before this, and he's left with the thought that I have to get on that stage tonight and play act. Mentre preso dal delirio, while I'm completely overwhelmed with, uh, in, well, in a delirium, he uses a, it's a very fascinating word, and there's a great chord that actually accompanies that. I don't know what, uh, I don't know what I'm saying and, and what I'm doing, but it's necessary. Come on, get yourself together, man. Bah! Are you really a man? Do you have the courage? He says, say to Forsen Wom, and then the famous laugh. <laughs> no, you are a clown. And then he, he goes on to, to sing about putting on the costume, vesti la jubba, and, and whitening up the face, and the, the people pay, and reader uh, vole, and they want to laugh. And if Harlequin steals Colombina, you've got to laugh, Pagliaccio. And everybody will applaud. Um, uh, sort of um, mocking gestures will replace spasms and tears. And, um, and a frown would take the place of, of weeping, of sobs and pain. Ah, and ridi, Pagliaccio. You have to laugh, Pagliaccio, sul tuo amo and over your destroyed love. Ridi del duol. Re, uh, uh, laugh about the pain that poisons, che t'avvelena il cuore. 
And then there's a fantastic, um, amazing um, postlude to that. Okay, it's just, um, you hear sort of a fate knocking on the door. I mean, it's not da 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 da, but, or anything, but it's a similar gesture. You hear it. <laughs> Violas, and then the double basses, and the timpani. Yada, yada, recitar, mentre preso dal delirium. Here's the delirium chord, listen. Non so più quel che dico, e quel che faccio. But it's necessary. Eppure dopo, sforzati. Are you a man? Come on. Sei tu forse un uomo. Tu sei pagliaccio. And he says it in such a mocking way, the way it's set, the trombones and the, and the timpani. Now, in a very, very simple but telling melody, a, a weeping melody, like, una furtiva, like they're talking about a tear. Here you hear the crying in his soul, though he's saying he must put on the costume and go out. <laughs> You hear these, 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 play them again. Kind of dissonant chords. The people pay and they want to laugh. And if Harlequin takes away your Columbina, You have to laugh. And everybody will applaud. You know, it, it, the music gets a little crazier. And he forces himself and he, with maximum yeah, <clears throat> voice. <clears throat> Your broken love. <clears throat> He talks about what's poisoning his soul. Yeah, that etc. etc. You get the idea. But you see how this aria and why it's so famous? Because it's just a fantastic story behind it and, and genuine in its, um, in its pathos. I mean, you, you, you feel sorry for the guy, you know, and yet you know he's going to kill, kill her in the end. <laughs> um, I, just to finish off, uh, let's go back to the other opera and, um, and invite um, so Jean to join us. Now, this is the guy who uh, was our Samson. <laughs> our our uh, Samson in uh, Samson and Delilah, uh, if you saw it. And um, uh, he took over the role, and he was just absolutely fantastic. And um, he's going to sing the final aria of Turiddu. Turiddu has made a pact with uh, Alfio, the husband of Lola, they've had a confrontation, and if, uh, if you saw in, in, in Godfather 3, the biting of the ear, well, there's a biting of the ear um, it, 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 <laughs> in, in this, where, which means when they embrace and you bite the other guy's ear, that means you're going to have a fight uh, to the death, okay? And, and that's the situation he's in. And so what does he do? Well, he goes to his mother, of course, 
and um, and he <laughs> and and in, and he does something very uncharacteristic. He's quite cavalier, this guy. Throughout, and perhaps not the most likable, but after spurning Santuzza for the whole opera and telling her to go away, he says, "If I do not come back," he says to his mother, "Please take care of Santuzza. Please look after her." It's very. That's kind of a twist that is very quite unexpected, actually. Um, there's a nervousness in this music at the beginning. There's a heightened adrenaline that then becomes um, melodramatic. The words, mamma, uh, quel vino è generoso, he says, you know, he, he, just before this, he sung a drinking song. And maybe he's drunk too much and he's had this confrontation with Alfio, so he's spinning a bit. Um, he says, maybe I've drunk too much, that's what it is. I'm going to go out for some air. But then he turns back to her and he says, but I want to, before I go, I want you to bless me like you did when I went off to be a soldier. And then, if I were not to return, if I were not, were not to return, then you must be a, the mo a mother to Santa, to Santuzza. Um, because he... he and now it's revealed that he promised to bring her to the altar. Okay? And she says, why are you talking to me this way? Ah, uh, nothing. It's, it's, it's just the wine talking. It's just the wine talking. Because he's not going to... He's not... Uh, he he's not, hasn't told her that, he, that he's made this pact with, with Alfio, which he knows he's going to lose. <laughs> he says, um, pray to God for me. And he, and he repeatedly asked to kiss her over and over again, um, like the, uh, they do in, in, in the South. Um, and, uh, ad, uh, and then he finally says, addio. And he repeats once again, if I were not to, to turn back, si io non tornassi, fate da madre a Santa, be a mother to Santa, another kiss, un bacio, mamma, addio, adios, okay? So, here we go. Music is dizzy, I see. Mama, Puelino, Ectoroso. Ectoroso, Otti. Troppi bicchieri, ne ho tracannati. fuori all'aperto ma prima voglio che mi benedite come quel giorno che par di soldato
belli così, figliuolo mio. Oh nulla, è il vino che mi ha suggerito, ma suggerito il vino. Papadoulos and Antonio Papano. Thank you all for such a fascinating insight to the music this evening. Sadly, that's the end of our insight, I'm afraid. Uh, don't forget, of course, that you can book tickets for this production only here at the Royal Opera. Uh, it's on the 5th of July and then has a run through the summer. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you to our guests and also our audience here at the Claw Studio. It's been a great pleasure bringing you our insight, which has been supported by Rolex. From all of us here at the Royal Opera House, good night. <laughs>